Good minutes? evening, everybody. Uh, start Steve. four minutes early. Yeah, it's all right. We can start four minutes early. Good evening. This is Steve Hodgden, uh, Modern Asset Management, uh, with our monthly uh, discussion. And joining me tonight tonight is uh, Dion DePauli, who I've known for a good number of years, and many of you also know. And uh, and we're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about note investing and particularly uh, a soapbox I've been on of late of uh, uh, people getting scammed and making bad deals and you know getting really getting hurt and so we're gonna we're gonna talk about our experiences and hopefully uh, help you with some fraud prevention and uh, help you uh, have a safer 2020 uh, so Dion say hi uh, give hi me everybody and so the question is, Dion, why are you the expert to talk to tonight? Well, that's probably the question of the year. It's, it's yeah. good that it's, it's early in the year, so I have some time to think about that. I, I'm not necessarily sure that I'm, I'm the expert. Certainly, I have a bit more experience than most of the folks that you're going to bump into. Um, you know, my background includes uh, senior portfolio management of a real estate investment fund. We were a broker dealer. Um, couple thousand assets under management in about 45 different states. So I have exposure to um, the, that distressed asset class uh, over the course of those states. I've been in real estate and real estate finance for about 20 years. Um, was uh, the director of operations for a consortium of, of mortgage, title, and appraisal. And now I hold a realtor license in, in the state of Indiana. Um, so expertise, I don't know, but experience for sure. Well, yeah. Well, and 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 I'll I'll vouch for your expertise. I uh, I came to you, gosh, coming up on four years ago, and you helped me uh, uh, buy a pool of accounts, uh, pool of mortgages. We bought we bought. 26 mortgages for about three quarters with a face value of about three quarters of a million dollars. Um, and we've uh, learned a lot about each other as we've managed that portfolio over the, over the past several years. And, um, and on a completely different side note, uh, some of the things we've been talking about uh, doing in Gary, Indiana, which is uh, in your backyard, uh, um, we'll leave for another. We'll leave for another conversation. But uh, I think you're, I think you're onto some, uh, some, some good stuff to uh, create some win-win situations in a city that's finally coming back after decades of being at the bottom. Yeah, we certainly. I, I, I you know, I think there's some opportunity. One of the things that you know the fund gave me a, an opportunity to see was you know, how to run into what was on fire when everybody else was running away. And I think that um, Gary specifically is, is one of those opportunities that investors should uh, take note of. Um, there's, there's, there's some upside coming through. It's, there's, some, there's some reinvestment that's taking place in that city. Not to, not to say that there isn't in other cities, but there's some reinvestment taking that city that I think um, warrants investor you know investor interest for yeah. sure and i think and, uh, the folks yeah, are gonna and make I, money and I think some of the topics that we're going to touch on today um will you know like you said make sense in lots of places um but uh, let's get into this and and as we as we touch on some slides i'll uh, i'll jump in with uh, some personal experience as we went along so but anyway um thanks all of you for being here and uh, here we go uh, so we put this out there to talk about uh, um, how to create some downside downside risk protection. Um, there was uh, one, two, three, I think eight significant uh, tens of millions of dollars of frauds uh, committed, uh, uh, um, uh, prosecuted last year, specifically in the note space. Um, there's uh, new funds that are coming up out of nowhere. There's uh, there's there's all kinds of things going on. One of the big one of the big names uh, in the training uh, side of this business uh, has fallen uh, uh, on hard times. I know somebody who's had another. Uh, anyway, it's I we can go on and on. So um, we're here to try to 
provide some triage maybe to try to provide some uh, support and to offer offer our support to uh, help uh, help you and and all of us uh, not make big mistakes so um, so I think the biggest problem is and I was trying to make this into one sentence was that note investors are making decisions based on bad information and lack of experience while believing sales pitches that are made to look like guaranteed profits. Um, and that, that kind of sums up everything I've seen in four years uh, around the mortgage note space uh, after 20 plus years in the distressed uh, credit space. Um, and I, my caveat on this, you know, we're supposed to give you a caveat that says, we're not lawyers, we're not CPAs, we don't give tax advice, this is not a solicitation. What I'm saying simply is, don't trust us either. All right, let's, uh, let's learn, all right? So, uh, so let's, let's try to take it from that. Um, like I said, uh, one of the biggest Ponzi schemes was Woodbridge Group that's been around for um, a long, long time in this space. And that was over a billion dollars in losses. And that primarily comes out of people's self-directed IRAs. And uh, that just, well, you know, we don't, we don't want anything to do with that. And we want to do what we can to help people not have that happen. So, um, Dion, go. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, so that was a good segue slide. You know, um, over the last several years, I, I've certainly, you know, had a lot of conversations with a lot of, you know, what I affectionately refer to as street level investors. And um, over the last 24 months, the market has changed significantly than it, more so than it was five years ago. A lot more participants, a lot more uh, misinformation. And uh, you know, I, I, I think you hit it on the head, you know, it, it, what an investor entering this space, you got to stop and you got to pause and ask yourself, you know, what is, what is the anticipation that you had? What were you expecting when you entered into this asset class? And notes as an asset class are, are especially, uh, you know, complex because you've got issues of real property you have issues of title, and you've got issues of foreclosure and bankruptcy. And if you have a multi-state portfolio, holy cow, you know, you've got different laws in different states, you've got all kinds of stuff that you need to, to know about. On top of that, you clearly, you know, everybody's a talking head. Um, the, the internet has, has brought us, you know, more counterparties, brokers, sellers, um, you know, institutional traders do what's called a KYC and know your counterparty. And, you know, you, you can't pick up the phone contrary to what the internet might tell you and, and produce a, a trade with JP Morgan. They're, they're not going to trade with you. you. You're, you're not qualified. Whether you could have a billion dollars, you can beat your chest all you want, but if you've never bought a series of loans in an institutional capacity, you're not going to qualify as, as a counterparty for them. And so, you know, one of the things that we kind of want to point out is, you know, how do you, how do you protect yourself? And one of those ways that you protect yourself is understanding who your counterparty is, who you're getting information from, not just educational information, but trade information. Um, who, is the, who is the actual counterparty that you're trading with? Uh, brokers are stepping into the way, you know, the internet's made that, you know, pretty, pretty, a, a lot more easy than it was years ago with wholesalers and real property and, you know, host, wholesaler brokers. And quite frankly, some of the education that is out there right now from, you know, some of these places that are, you know, household names to, at some extent is really just talks about, hey, listen, you, you can just go broker loans. And, you know, you got to ask yourself, what's the experience level of the person that you're getting the information from? Um, and then on top of that, you know, that, that that's going to then flow into now you're the investor, you're making the decisions, you know, what was your expectation of return? And oftentimes, especially of late, you know, I see, you know, bad bids uh, and mismanaged expectations. You know, there is an unreasonable expectation of return for loans uh, based on some of these conversations. And we'll talk a little bit more about return. So, um, 
again, kind of stemming from where did we come from and how do we get here? And, and, and a lot of people don't know this. So, you know, again, I, you know, a little bit of my background, I've, I've been in real estate, real estate finance for like 20 years. Um, I ran a um, fixed income broker dealer as a senior portfolio manager that we were invested in uh, 45 different states, a couple thousand assets. Uh, our primary vehicle for investment were whole loan mortgages, not because we were smart prior, prior to crash. Um, we, we had to just deal with the, the, the portfolio that we had. Uh, I was originally hired in as, as the, the trading desk and I took over portfolio management. So when we look at what, where we came from in 2007, a lot of this distressed market didn't exist. You know, um, distressed servicing didn't exist. It used to go, if you, if, if borrowers missed, you know, three payments, they went to a debt collection company. Now we have specialized distressed, distressed debt. Um, servicing companies. And, you know, probably all the way up until 2014, there really wasn't a lot of street level uh, participation, street level investor participation. The market is still controlled by institutional investors. Um, but that's, you know, th there's certainly influences that are changing that. Um, but one of the reasons that street level investors got involved in notes was because the real property for fix and flip was extremely limited because everybody was getting foreclosed. So, you know, the investors wanted to get access to that inventory and, you know, the sales pitch started that, hey, if you start buying the paper, then you can be the bank and that'll give you access to those, to those assets. And that's not necessarily untrue, but, you know, we'll, we'll, there's a caveat to that we'll, we'll touch on in a minute or two. Um, today, there's more street level investors than ever. There's more, you know, there's new vendors and new service providers. There's a slew of new specialty servicers. There is, um, you know, every day brings new street level investors that are wanting to participate in the space. And, you know, the most interesting thing there is there's, there's people that I knew five years ago that are now, you know, what we could call talking heads as, as experts in the industry. And, you know, one of the things we're going to touch on tonight is, you know, how, how do, how do you protect yourself? If, if you don't know what you don't know, how do you judge an expert? I mean, and, and can you judge an expert? Yeah. And it seems like the decisions that preached about with some thousand, with 3000 online posts <laughs> over the course of the last seven years, um, they, they seem to be growing again. And, and that's a little scary. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so this was um, this bigger, bigger pockets is where I found you, um, and that's uh, and that and Facebook and all these places are just marvelous places to get get just a glimpse of uh, of something and not anything that's real. No, it's not school. You know, it's not school. It's not the it's not the eight classes you have to take to get a realtor's license. It's not it's not the two years you have to work in the business to get a contractor's license. You can you can just go throw money at somebody and suddenly you're in the note business. And well, and I did exactly that. You know, I did exactly that. I went out and bought a note because the people that were teaching teaching classes and wanting big money didn't they didn't know what I knew after thirty years of debt collection. So, you know, so I came in, I came in from a like business, um, you know, can, having bought and sold hundreds of thousands of accounts over the years. Um, and turns out three months in, I realized I didn't know, I didn't know anything. And so I found you, you know, so, but, uh, and there's, and that's not to say that there aren't other good folks out there that have good data that have been around, been around a while and, and are sensible, you know. But it's uh, but it's people with a year experience setting up uh, set, setting up uh, funds and taking people's retirement income uh, retirement savings and betting it on uh, real estate going up um, is just you know it's just not anyway that's why we're here um, yeah and so there's so there's no barriers to entry. There's no licensing. There's no, there's, there's no central place to complain. There's no, uh, there's, there's no rating, you know, there's, it's just, you know, if I, if I can make a really good web page and, and articulate a story, um, I can declare myself uh, an expert. 
And, you know, and I, and I said, I've, I've got 39 years of debt collection experience and credit experience, and I am nowhere near um, an expert in, in this arena. And, you know, I said, I've been, I've been around this a lot, you know, so I've been a property manager and uh, for years and I've owned lots of uh, rentals and commercial property. And this is, this is, uh, this is, this is why we're talking to you. So I like this slide that you did. And it's like this, uh, um, this is exactly to one of the points about uh, non-performing loans. Yeah. So, you know, I've been, I've been quieter on the interwebs over the last, you know, 24 or 36 months than, than I was previously. And doesn't, doesn't mean I'm not involved. Uh, not, uh, doesn't mean I'm not plugged in, right? I'm a, I'm a reader, not a commenter as much as I used to. I used to drink a lot of coffee and comment. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm in some, some groups, you know, the standard places, bigger pockets, Facebook, you know, LinkedIn, et cetera, et cetera. This, this was just a prime example of what I think the, 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 the street level space is at, right? And, you know, you could pause and read this, read through this, but fundamentally you, you've got, you've got investors that are buying assets and then asking for group talk, um, essentially looking for the answer they want to find. Right. I mean, you, you, you don't want the real answer. And one of the things that I've, you know, that I've discovered over the years is you, you really, people never liked my brutal brand of honesty. <laughs> it's, it's, it, it was, you know, you're not going to make billions of dollars. You're not going to be a fortune 500 company overnight. This is not an asset class that is going to get you rich. There's, this is hard work. These are, these are tough assets. And this is a great example. This is, you know, completely, complete misinformation. But the, the, the saddest part about this is there's a backstop to, to the real information. And, and so what you see on the top side of the slide here is, is, you know, some commentary about, you know, what do you do? You know, what are you doing with your, you know, NPLs that you bought that you're not, you know, issuing any, any, uh, any kind of coupons to, or any kind of servicing comments to, and, you know, you can see the comments, one gets a like, which I thought was hilarious. Um, but it's, it's, it's really emphasized here and hell no, there's no payments to report. You, you let the foreclosure trustees are talking. Here's the problem with that. There, there is a requirement by the CFPD and, and servicing for continuity of contact. And that's the case in all debt collection. <laughs> and so this is really the, the group speak that becomes a real issue that, you know, a lot of investors are going online and they're, you know, they're entering these groups, whether it's a meetup locally or it's online or whatever. And you're taking advice from people that really have no flipping clue what they're talking about, you know, and, you know, case in point, what you see on the bottom side of this is, is the examination procedures for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which if you get, in, if, if, if that borrower challenges you, they can pick up the phone, they can make a complaint to the CFPB for free. And if you're self-servicing your own note, these are the modules that they do for an investigation. And I, you know, Steve, you and I have both always been advocates for don't service your own stuff. Um, that's never changed. And here's, here's a, here's a good look at why, because these are the modules. This is a, this is a 50 page document. This is just the table of contents at the beginning, right? So um, most of the time you, you, you don't know what you don't know. And that's what makes this asset class dangerous. And when you think you know what you don't know, you're, you're, you're a liability to yourself. So, you know, how do we, how do we get to the real answers? Look, you know, I've always said there's no magic in this asset class, um, but you got to be willing to, you know, put the work in, right? You know, um, the regulations are out there, you know, you know, regulation X, regulation Z. If you don't know what those are, you should, you should Google them. You know, you'll find a wiki page. You can, you can read the actual law. I've literally read Dob Frank when it came out and there was so much mis misinformation that came out around some of the implications of Dob Frank that it was, it was staggering. And I, you know, a good portion of some of my online commentary dealt with that. And 
so so the information is there, but you, but you got to put the time in, and and you got to be willing to do the work. And it, and this is in the NASA class. And to that to that, there really is a there, there really is a, a you got to come back to the reason. You know, why do you why do you want to spend all this time learning all of this detailed stuff so that you can so that you can administer your own uh, mortgage uh, uh, loan servicing business when you can outsource it for fifteen dollars a month right you don't it's 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 nonsense or a hundred dollars a month right you know distress right. servicing is a hundred dollars a month or less um, and you know oftentimes I call that the race to the bottom right you know everybody wants to spend the least amount of money possible to manage an asset that they don't fully understand and that's the dangerous part but um i've i've never held an asset i've never managed an asset that wasn't serviced by a servicer and I've, and that gives that gives me somebody to hold accountable for and and you know look through the couple thousands of assets that i've been through you know I, there's things that i know that m more so than most uh, but there's still stuff that I don't know. And there's an ongoing, you know, the environment is fluid, right? You know, this is, we're talking about, you know, legal influences uh, across state borders. Um, it's a, you know, it's a full-time job for us. I, 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 I don't ever want to be a servicer. <laughs> you know, it's, their job is tough. Yeah. Um, and, and we pick on them a lot. You know, there's a lot of investors that pick on them, but it's a tough, it's a tough gig. You know, it's, it's a tough gig. They got to, they saw that, you know, they got a lot to manage and they got a lot of clients and um, there's a lot to know. And it's a, it's a lot to stay up on for sure. And it's, it's the same as a property manager, you know, that's that nobody likes their property manager. Um, I said, I ran collection agencies for 20 years. Nobody likes their collection agency. Um, and the, the, the detail and, ex, and experience necessary to, to do this is, you know, is, is just, I can't imagine anybody one off deciding that they were going to buy, you know, but I, well, but I know a guy, I know, I know a guy who's processed over a hundred, um, uh, second, second mortgage foreclosures. Um, and you would say he does it by himself, but no, he's got a lawyer. He's got the right people. He's built a machine to do it. Um, but he was also, you know, in his thirties, you know, most of the people that come in that we talk to are around my age. I'm in my sixties. And they're looking to they're looking to transition. They're looking to build a cash flow. Um, some of the younger guys are looking to hit home runs, uh, um, doing uh, doing non performing, and you know non performing is okay. But again, even more work and lots of regulatory issues when you consider that you're trying to take somebody's house from them. So, yeah. So I've uh, I've been to all these places on this screen and a whole bunch more. Um, I went off I, and I, <laughs> I just want to point out before we go any further, because so Steve's made some modifications to these slides, right? <laughs> you changed your picture out. I still ended up with my son. <laughs> That's funny. <All> right. <laughs> That's fair. It looks, so, it looks so much younger in that one. <laughs> well, yeah, it's five years ago. Uh, it's been a tough five years. Oh, wait, it's been the five years I've been in notes. Um, <laughs> there you go. So, um, yeah, so like I said, I, I've been everywhere. I've done everything. I've taken every two-hour this, half-day that, three-day whatever. And, and like I said, there isn't, there isn't a curriculum. There isn't a syllabus on how to learn how to do this. No, you know, it's what's funny, Steve, too, is, is, you know, one of the most common questions on on the interwebs is that drive drive through order list of how do I do due diligence? And, you know, I, you know, to, to speak to the question here of, you know, what what makes a guru, it, it seems that the guru is the one that delivered that answer. And, you know, oftentimes we've been the poo pooers of that. Um, and, 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 and fundamentally, when you go and talk to the people that subscribe to that cookie cutter template kind of idea or boilerplate approach to uh, whole loan investing, um, those are the folks that got burned because it's not cookie cutter. 
this is not a homogenic, uh, you know, homogenic asset class. It's not, you know, real property isn't homogenous. You know, one, two, three Main Street is not the same as two, three, four Main Street. And the same can be said when you attach financing to it, to, to the nth degree. And unfortunately, you know, today's day and age, we think we have access to this information, but the average person, look, they want to spend, you know, a minute reading information. They want to consider themselves an expert. And, and that's when it gets very, very dangerous. And, and one of the things that, that kind of coincides with that is, you know, if, if everybody is an expert, then, then, then how, how, how do you, if you don't have any information or you don't know anything about the asset class, how do you judge who's telling you what, what, what's going on in the asset class? And more and more investors, you know, you and I have both talked to, you know, a, 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 a large consortium of investors across the board. And one of the things that they tend to come back with is, well, you know, it's just learning money. My, my next hundred thousand dollars is where I'm really going to do well. <laughs> you know, like I just burned this hundred thousand dollars up, but that's okay because look at what I learned. And I'll tell you again, you know, at the fund, you know, we had several thousand assets like, across 45 different states. And that, you know, that's what gave me my experience for sure. Um, you know, we're talking about a hundred grand, you know, a hundred grand as a street level investor how many investments did you make? You know, and I can tell you that there's, you can, you can speak to this too. Cause you know, you and I have been through some stuff in, in your portfolio that um, I, I didn't see coming. You didn't see coming, right. you know, and, and, and that's, that's one of the, that's one of the, 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 the barriers to this, to this asset class is that there's just stuff that you don't know until it slaps you in the face. Well, and, and to, to that, so when I was, before I decided to buy performing first, I was going to follow what my experience has been and I was going to buy non-performing second. And one of the, one of the people very successful in the space told me that to start, I needed to buy five because two were going to go bad, two were going to break even, and one was going to be the home run. And I thought, why would I knowingly take a 40% loss out the door. Right. Why would, I, why would I do that? So I bought, you know, what did I buy? We bought 33, well, we've, we've got 33 performing mortgages that have been in and out of our machine um, the last four years. And because what was I getting into this for? I was getting into this to have steady cash flow income. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to be a landlord again. Yeah. Yeah, so this, the idea of jumping in to lose money is just, well, I, and again, people are playing with their retirement. You can't, you can't make it back. We don't have time. So, so anyway, so I can talk about brokers, but you should talk about brokers because you'll be more polite than me. <laughs> I'm not so sure, right? Well, so. well, well you, you're, you're not really a broker, but you brought me a relationship and you helped me pick through 150 assets to pick the 25 that I, that, that I wanted. And, you know, we had a, we had a list of, I think it was probably like 40 and we went back and forth on them um, and narrowed it down to the ones that fit what I, what I thought I wanted at the time. Um, I had my own kind of buy box that I was trying to fit them in. And, uh, and, you know, and, it, and in the main, it turned out, turned out to be just fine. Um, but everybody's got a different kind of kind of approach. The the brokers and the trade desks. You know, I my my first note I bought was a was a contract for deed, which I didn't know what that was uh, from the Harbor Portfolio uh, batch, and and I paid I paid thirteen thousand dollars for a note that the broker paid nine for, um, and. Yeah. And and none of that was disclosed. You know, I pieced that together. You know, over over time. Um, and again, there's you can't you can't do that in a real estate transaction. Fees have to be disclosed. I mean, everybody's got to know what the other side is. You know, most states you have to have a buyer representation and a seller representation. Um, you know, in in this world, there's no barrier to entry. I can I could have declared myself a note broker 
you know, the day, the day I, the day I started. Yeah. And, you know, I think we're at a point in, <laughs> in both the real property and real estate asset, you know, marketplace where, you know, the rise of the broker joker is back. Right. And they, they, we call them different words. Uh, you know, in the real property segment, there's the wholesaler. And, you know, we, we refer to them on, in, the, in the note broker space as, as just broker jokers. And, you know, fundamentally what they are is, you know, they're, they're desk jockeys, which, you know, I have to be a little, you know, cautionary because, you know, I, I, I broker, you know, I'm, I'm a real estate broker and I broker loans. And, um, and, and certainly we all started with no, with a minimal level of experience. Um, and so I, I'm not unappreciative of that. And, you know, some of the educational material that's out there is really geared towards, you know, talking people through, hey, look, start as a broker and, you know, and, and then turn into an investor. And so if you're the investor, the only one looking out for your interest, you know, from me, from you, from whoever it is, is you. It's your money, you know, and, and so you got to start there. And, um, you know, kind of goes back to a little to know your counterparty you know, circumstances is, you know, it used to be a huge problem back in the day in, you know, 2009, I could tell you a story, I'll tell you a brief story where I passed around, I don't know, I think I had a hundred unit portfolio out in the market and long story short, it came back to me. I jumped on a conference call under a different alias. Um, and there were six brokers on the phone. Everybody wanted 2%. And the guy who I actually sent it to was on the phone representing it was his. And the, what was even funnier was the price that I put it out at, which I was pretty clear. I was, you know, I was a portfolio manager. I, I needed my money. And they had, they had reduced the price, which was really absurd to me. It was like, no transaction is ever going to take place at this number. I'm not selling at this number. Like I'm the guy that owns these and I'm, you know, I've got a number, you got to hit it. Otherwise there's nothing to talk about. Um, I, you know, I think a lot of that is still out there. I, I, I certainly don't involve myself in a lot of those conversations, but I think that a lot of that, um, I, I see it in the real property space. I see, you know, the wholesalers are, are sort of filling in that gap, you know, where they're picking off, um, you know, anybody can grab a buyer. They, they have these buyers lists now, they trade them between each other, and then they're joint venturing to sell you an asset. And so just like you said, right, th there, there's no um, disclosure on note sales. And, and so notes, note investor, if you're a note investor, be, be cautious, because if you don't know who your counterparty is, you don't know who's giving you that asset, um, shoot, man. You know, if, if you if you don't have the skill to really put a price on stuff and you don't really understand the value of stuff, they're, they're going to smoke you. You're going to get smoked. Yeah. Yeah. No, and it, uh, you know, on that one little file, I, I, I went to school and, and again, you know, I had decades of uh, credit and collection and legal experience. And I, I knew more what to do than most folks. And, but it was, you know, if, if I, had, if I didn't have, if I was just somebody trying to learn that, that, Asset never would have uh, never would have become performing again. You know, so um, so um, now the other side of the counterparties are uh, the people that are doing the selling. You know, and uh, you know, I, you know, my my opinion of the Condor trade desk isn't real high. Um, <laughs> buyer beware. Um, there's you know there's inventory there, but it didn't fit doesn't fit for me very much. Um, you know, we we've had people out there say. You know, go call banks. Go be go be the institutional broker, and you know that doesn't happen. Uh, yeah. No. Listen. You know, what, I I hate that. <laughs> I hate that. Yeah. You're 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 not you, you you as a street level investor are never calling a, a a community or a local bank and purchasing a loan at any reasonable level. Their money is cheaper than yours. Their expectations are higher than yours. Uh, their workout capacity is better than yours. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, th that's not real. You know, when, 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 when gurus say that, I, I, it really just, it just irks me. You're, you're never going to pull off a trade. 
you know, just, just the same way that you're not going to pull off a trade at a high institutional level. You know, you don't have enough capital. You don't have enough experience. The bank doesn't need you. Their capital is, is cheaper than yours. And this is the barrier of entry for investors when it comes to sellers. You know, so, so where do you find a seller? Look, th that doesn't mean that there aren't assets available out there in the marketplace. You know, assets are worked through, you know, they're passed down from institution to institution. The street is nowhere near the top of the list. Um, it, it doesn't mean that you can't be a good investor at the street level from an institutional asset. It just means you kind of have to wait your turn. And you have to be, you know, you've, you've got to be strong. You've got to be confident in what you're doing, what it's going to cost you. And you've got to have some confidence in your bid. And, you know, to, with that too, now more than ever there, you know, over the last four or five years, I suppose, there's, there's more real property investors that are turning to seller finance as, as an exit strategy. And, you know, just because they collected 10%, you know, I've, I've looked at these files, the 10% down, 12% interest rate, sounds great. Then you look at a file, there's no credit history, there's no income, there's no ability to repay. It's, you know, it's garbage. Um, it, you know, so there's deals out there, there's sellers out there, both in the private market and the institutional market. Um, you know, you, 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 you talked about one of the kind of parties that, you know, that, that I play with a lot and, and I, I still have a lot of institutional relationships, um, from, from their perspective, it's a function of, I can sell it to you, Mr. Street level investor, give me a good bid because I can execute at this level. And that's, you know, and we get frustrated with that. You know, we, we get frustrated with the seller that has a capability that's higher than ours or the, or the competing bid. And, you know, I see that a lot that come in and they're just kind of, you know, what you would call a vulture bid. And, you know, the bid's not going to be successful because the alternative is I'll just work it out myself. You know, the, the, there was a notion back in 2009 and 10 that the banks had to get rid of all of this stuff. That's gone. I mean, there, there's no, there is no FDIC command. There's no uh, regulatory, you know, overlook oversight that's, that's causing Texas, what's called the Texas ratio, which is the default ratio held by a financial institution for deposits, um, to, to liquidate. Everybody's in good standing. So there's no requirement for them to liquidate. There, there is no fire sale anymore. Mm -hmm. um and and so so now you you know look you, you need to know who your counterparty is you need to understand are you getting it from a broker are you are you getting it from a seller there's different ideas if that was institutionally originated or privately originated um you know and 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 what's 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 caused it to to, to be discounted you know the institutional seller is going to know a lot more about their asset than the private seller you know so it's, it, you know, if you were to start somewhere, you could start with this private seller and it's probably a little bit more of a table negotiation. Institutional guy, the number's the number, otherwise leave me alone. The buyers, <laughs> hey buyers. Um, yeah, so the, lots of, there's, I, I swear every day there's more and more more and more folks. Um, the, 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 the downside part of being a buyer here is, is really just the lack of experience and education. And, and that comes with the idea that you've spent, you know, $15,000 going to a weekend seminar and, you know, you read a book, you read some online posts, you're familiarizing yourself with the asset class, but, but you're not. You're really not. You're really not. You know, one of the it goes back to one of the main questions is there's no cookie cutter or boilerplate education for any of this, and 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 nor will there ever be. Um, and you know, so so you can go out and get Jimmy Nymphier's book, and you know, go to the 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 conventions and seminars and stuff, and you can hear everybody talk. But what you always have to remember is this is a fluid industry because there's so much influence from you know, state legislation, foreclosure laws, bankruptcy laws, 
uh, federal legislation that influences, you know, um, you know, creditor and debtor rights. Uh, it, it's it's an ever changing industry, and this is one of the issues that why education will never be up to speed. Jimmy Napier's book, which is often, oftentimes one of the most you know quoted books to go out and read. Look, read something. I'm not saying don't start nowhere, but don't take that as this is what it looks like today. And that, was, uh, that book was written 35 years ago. It, exactly. I mean, and think about when did, you know, look, Dob Frank, you know, Dob Frank came out in 2010 and 12 and had massive impacts with, with, with regulatory, you know, with, with regulations, you know, across the nation. And that, you know, that, that's dated now. You know, so so states have states have you know cleaned their process up, and you know one of the things that you got to remember too is before the before the great crash of two thousand and seven, we you know the savings loan crash happened in in, in the nineteen eighties, and we, we really didn't deal with that the RTC days, but what, when the crash happened in two thousand and seven, a whole new market was a, was created. This distressed market was created. Distressed loan servicers were created. Distressed debt investing was created. That's where this all came from. And you know, every once in a while, you'll talk to somebody that that was around in the RTC days in the savings loan crisis, and that was still a little bit more of an institutional liquidation and exchange. Where um, you know the 2007 crash was a consolidation, but it affected you know state law, state and federal law. And, you know, the, the RTC didn't, we didn't get a Dodd-Frank out of the RTC. We got a Dodd-Frank out of the, out of the 2000, 2007 crash. And a lot of that had to do with the market changing with the way that we finance stuff, which was the growth of securitization, right? And, yeah. you know, go, go watch The Big Short, excellent movie. Mm -hmm. um, I traded with Lou Ranieri's fund. Um, good dudes, you know, not, nothing bad to say about them, but... You know, it, most people don't understand the way that we finance real property anymore. Right. Um, it's, not, it's not the same. One of the best examples of the way that I think people think about financing, uh, which, which always I, I, I like to bring up around the holidays, is It's a Wonderful Life and George Bailey and, and his big bad counterparty, right? Mm -hmm. That's not the way banks work anymore. You're not going to your local bank and they're not holding your paper. Yeah. They're selling to the largest mortgage investor in the world, which is Fannie Mae. Second largest is, is Ginny Mae, and then Freddie Mac's probably right behind them. Mm -hmm. um, right. These are the guys that set the standards. And there, there's education there. If you want to learn what it takes to make a loan, Fannie Mae's been around since 1934. They've got a book of underwriting standards. And that's what, that's what your retail loan originator writes a loan to. Uh, you, want to you want to learn how to underwrite a file, go read that right you know that that's what they're looking for well, they're but, looking I, for I, but i can never get started if that's what i have to do so here you know no. there's, there's, <laughs> there's a dozen people on this on this phone call that are either looking to get started or have started trying to improve their game and so you know so what, what i did is after after quickly realizing that i needed expertise and this is not a commercial for you but i hired you right and and you used specific software, which great depth, written to this, written to this exact, uh, this exact uh, asset, and helped me dissect portfolios that were for sale to find the ones that fit what I was looking for. And I was looking for, I was looking for uh, borrowers with long time in home. I was looking for people that had, that you know, had some kind of level of stability. You introduced me to to a fund that was liquidating their lower balance stuff and and opened a door for me and then we cherry picked from that from that fund and then put them over to security national and we did we did all of the things that we could do by the book because i wanted to make sure that i did things exactly the way they were supposed to so when i started bending rules later when I started writing my own seller finance deals, that yeah. I was that I, I I was not going to unwittingly go out and you know hurt people, right, right. And so, yeah. and so you know, so and I you know, 
I know, and I have, and I have, as you've got a little button here, you've not, I have not started um, a fund. I have not worked with other people's money, you know, and so, and I've, you know, we've got way more experience than other folks that are, you know, looking to do that. The idea of me learning, you know, I, I hate having to educate a lawyer who's charging me by the hour. Um, so, yeah, it, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, the, 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 the genre of buyers that it's out there, um, even over the last 12 months, there, there's a lot of newbies that are interested in going out and getting other people's money. And when you look at their investment that they made, it's, it's, been, a, it's been a disaster. Yes. Um, and, and the, the mindset there is often, well, I'll do better with your money, but you didn't do good with your money, <laughs> you know? Right. So, um, you know, it, it's, there, there's lots of, you know, the, the, the second lean investor, which, you know, I'll, I'll poke at too, you know, I, I, I often pick on that. I've been picking on it for forever, as, certainly as long as you've known me. And I, I don't like the second lean investor because it's exactly what you mentioned earlier, where it's, you know, what they get solicited is buy a, buy a series of these assets because, you know, you're, you're going to have such a great loss. But don't worry, there's sure, to be, there's sure to be one home run in this that makes up for everything. And that is just utter flipping nonsense. The reality is... You know, and, and, and I want this to see, you know, sink in for all the, you know, for all the viewers at home it is if you're if you're buying institutional, if you're if you're a downstream from an institution, make no bones about it. I know more than you. Oftentimes they know more than me and you're outgunned. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, and that's really what it is. You know, I had, a, I had a very good conversation with a trade desk recently. I'll just use this as an example. Um, where even in our software model, you know, we have time and expenses all built out. And, um, and he, you know, he, he slapped me in the face with, you know, he's like, dude, you're at, you know, you're at an 18-month disposition. He's like, I, I, I. I can get this. I can get this done in a judicial state in 12 months. And he literally spelled it out in a you know page and a half email on how he's doing it. And I was I was blown out of the water. I was like, wow, you guys are managing your assets very well. And but that's sort of the reality of the world. You know, the guys with the big capital that are managing lots of assets are figuring it out, and they're figuring it out faster and better than what you know what you're going to figure out with a one with a one-off investment or you know a small small portfolio and that's i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna move us along we're running up on yeah. time we yep. spent more than a half an hour telling people don't do this right. um, so <laughs> so let's go into you know let's go into why you know why should you do this and you know, yeah. does, it, does it fit um this slide you're comparing the market rate of return um, from the S&P and the MBS world, right? Right. So. You know, so, so just we're, we're giving ourselves some anchor back to reality, right? I think a lot of investors approach this asset class with unrealis unrealistic expectations of return. So what is, what's cash flow worth and what's, a, what's an illiquid asset worth, right? I think that's, that's the caveat to, to this slide. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, 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 the S&P really isn't some great performance. You can stick your money anywhere. You get to be the driver. Everybody wants to self-direct their own IRAs nowadays. Um, you know, they can, they can read into this. But, you know, mortgage-backed mortgage securities are considered a, a little bit of a notch above treasury bills. They're, they're relatively, you know, they're, they're, they're not overly risky, quote, unquote. Um, and you know, in 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 the equities market, you can certainly earn you know eight percent, and you're going to pay a fee. You know, maybe you're netting you know six or seven, depending on who your IRA or your RIA is. So, just a benchmark for us to you know anchor ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the next two slides here are some of the uh, the most recent Fannie Mae large portfolio sales, just to give us an idea of trade levels, again, they can pause and, and read through these. Um, 
but what this speaks to is there is no uniform bid. You know, I call it barstool banter, right? Where, yeah, I bought a non-performing loan for 50% of 50 cents on the dollar, or I bought a, you know, second lien, or I bought a whatever. There, there's so much more detail that needs to be involved in that discussion that it doesn't, none of that makes sense. Yeah, and the easy comparison is um, how much does a car cost? Right. Right, and so um, I highlighted two things here. Um, to talk about yield. And so here's a, a re-performing uh, sale. So these are uh, loans back to making payments. And I think it was, I think the rule is they had to have made three or six or something. Um, that the note rate was three and a half percent. And that file sold for 97% of, of uh, what it was uh, uh, well, of, of principal. Yeah. So, so less than a nickel. Yeah, and so that's letting it right, and that's and these are the big, big sales. This isn't me saying I'd like to buy a mortgage this month, right? Right. Right. So this is you know I'm you know we're looking at thirty, fifty, seventy thousand dollar notes, um, or smaller, um, and we're hanging. I'm hanging my hat on a ten percent coupon, hoping to net eight. Right. right. Yeah. And, and, and your competition, this is your competition. Yeah. Make yeah. no bones about it. Yeah. Right. That's right. That's right. And, you know, and they're, they're satisfied with a note rate of three and a half percent. Well, because their cost, of, their cost of funds is way different than mine. Yeah. You know, they're borrowing, they're borrowing from the other side of the federal window and giving it to this side. And so, so that brings us back to um, where, do, where do you look for paper and you've talked about private versus institutional um there's bad players in the institutions too um you know there's been some there've been some uh some people out there have been writing oh well um aquin and harbor loans have been uh problematic of being grossly over um actual real asset value um uh, almost everybody who uh is a, a talks about the seller finance space will tell you that uh, that you can sell something on credit for more money than you can sell it for cash and that is true but then when you turn around and sell an inflated uh, uh, mortgage you're while well, you buy an inflated mortgage you're walking in you're walking into trouble there too so, yeah, you know, so this, is, this is part of the understanding what it is you're buying and what the real value is but financing does not increase the value of the collateral. That's right. That's right. Right. I mean, that's, yeah. that's, that's the statement, right? Yeah. And, and yeah. yeah, it's, it's, it, and so, you know, look, there's, there's certainly some, some high coupon paper out there, you know, t t t y you see high coupons for privately originated paper. And the reason why is there is, there is generally a lack of adherence to a standard underwriting organization, right? So That's Fannie right. Mae being, being you know, the, the most well-known underwriting, you know, established in the market, in the marketplace. You know, you know, Steve, when Steve goes and sells, you know, or seller finance a property in, you know, wherever, he's not, he, he's not drilling through an underwriting process like, like a loan broker is, a retail loan originator has to, in order to sell that loan to Fannie Mae. Doesn't mean that he doesn't have qualifications, right? And, you know, and we mitigate our, our risk as a, as a seller financer to, you know, a, a, you know a, a nice down payment, some level of acceptable credit, um, and some investigation into income and assets. Ho hopefully that's the least, right? Mm -hmm. um, but as we all know, you know, look, if that borrower could have gone retail, they're not knocking on your door. If, if he could go out and get, a, you know, a 4% loan, he, he's not having a conversation with you for a 10% loan. So, you know, there, there typically is a haircut on privately originated loans and, and sellers, you know, seller, sellers that are originating their own paper understand that. And oftentimes they, they work that that discount into the way that they're manipulating the deal. 
And I don't have a problem with that. Look, if you, you know, but that discount comes from your equity. The discount doesn't come from inflation of the value of the collateral, mm -hmm. right? Again, financing doesn't increase the value of the collateral. Okay. So you know, the, the only two counterparties out there in the market are, are those two sources. You're going to get it privately originated or you're going to get it institutionally originated. You know, you, you, I, when, if, when I do due diligence, we, you know, we expect to see a very light file from privately originated stuff. There's things that come along with that, you know, lack of accounting history, probably isn't service bright, blah, 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 blah. Um, and these are the reasons that you put a discount in there. Um, institutionally, these guys know what they're doing. They, they have to follow the rules. The, the, you know, Betty Borrower is going to sue JP Morgan Chase before she's going to sue, you know, Steve. Um, not to say you don't both think, don't don't both get sued, but J.P. Morgan Chase got a bigger pocketbook than Steve. You know, make no bones about it. Um, so so they're under the gun. They've got a you know they've got the the, the laser points on on their on their forehead a little bit more. Um, you, you you tend to expect a better file from institutions um, than than you do private guys. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, look, both can be good sources of of product. Don't get me wrong. You know, we, you and I have both been out and chatted with both and I've, you know, I've, I've, I've bought and sold from, from each of the two types of counterparties there. And, um, you know, kn knowing your counterparty, it, it helps you understand the level of due diligence and the things you need to look for. Right. Yeah. And, and so it all comes back to, you know, come back, come back to understanding what it is you're buying. And, and so for those, those of us that, uh, still but well yeah here no here we go so what what's it worth and how do you how do you figure those things out right so it's uh analysis of the uh of the payment stream which which you have to get with every loan you buy right there's a fairly standard long uh, uh string of data that you get when you look at a when you look at an account for those of you that haven't uh looked at what they call tapes um i'd encourage you to uh, uh look at one and see what's there um understanding the interest rate a lot of what i've bought has been uh, modified loans and understanding what what's what right uh, and uh, uh the, well then you would pick up from there it's subject property and foreclosure laws and the things we've learned in louisiana uh <laughs> <laughs> so. louisiana was yeah louisiana louisiana what came in as a, as a little bit of an oddball but um, you know, look, I, I, I certainly have been looking at this asset class for a very long time. And I, um, I often um, get that some of the, I, I can look at a, a very extensive data tape and without, without slicing it and probably have a better well, understanding. Let me, let, me, let me throw something out here. Would you, for, for those of us on the phone and the, uh, those of us on the call and those of us who read this later, if you, if somebody has an account and a, a, a mortgage they're considering buying, will you weigh in and give them 15 minutes of your time to, uh, to take a peek at it? Yeah, I, I 100% will. I, you know, I, 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 I love to do that. <laughs> um, and I, I'm more than happy to, to, to take a peek um, and, and give my opinion. One, one of the things, if you know me from any of the 3000 posts I have online or the couple of videos that Steve and I have done, I, don't get me wrong. I always have an opinion. Yeah. Um, and I treat your investment like it's mine. You know, I, you know, I'm going to give you my brutal brand of honesty and whether I think it's a good thing, a bad thing, what it, it and, and it's, it's not a, it's not, it's an opinion. It's not, it's an iteration, right? You know, you kind of go through iterations and you, you look at it a couple of times and, that's the way that we do due diligence too, is it's not just we, you know, we sit down and it's a one time done. It's, you know, you, you, you get it, you go get some more information, you come back, you go back over it, you do it again, you do it again, you do it again. These are complex things. Um, and, and in order to handle complexity, you got to touch it a couple of times. Um, but I'm happy to, I'm happy to always look or talk about, you know, what decisions other investors are making and, whether you like what I say or not is, is not, you know, I, I won't, I won't. So, so you welcome, <laughs> you welcome people. This is, here's your, here's your little plug. You welcome people to write to you at the email address in the lower right hand corner. 
yes. uh, with with questions and if you're if you're a buyer or a seller yes right yeah how, if you're, how, you're a if shopper you're a, if you're a seller geez call me let me help okay. you let me let me help you let me help you get set up if you're a buyer i'm happy to look at it oftentimes buyers come to me with I, again i go back to the uh race to zero um you know there is a level of due diligence based on your file not based on a checklist and you need to get you need to check those boxes off to make sure that you're getting what you get because I, I i certainly catch a lot of investors post purchase and then they they want help with disposition and they don't have enough information or data or or file mm -hmm. to actually do anything with and that's that's when it's really, and that's when it's really sad, to be honest with you. So I, so I wanted to, so I, so I love this equation, <laughs> uh -huh. um, right? So, the, so the rule of 72, like, so, you know, whatever, I talk to a lot of investors and I have a series of interview questions that just come out naturally over the course of time. Um, and one of the one of the things that we always talk about is, you know, what's the expectation of return, um, and what's your what's your plan, and so you know if you take the example of I've got a hundred thousand dollars, we we all want to we all want to quadruple that, for sure, like that's a that's a no brainer, but now how do I do that with you know mitigating my risk and and you know and and taking action. And the rule of 72, a lot of people don't really know this rule, I think, but it's a simple math equation. And the rule of 72 says at 7.2% at interest, you'll double, your, you'll double your investment in 10 years. The opposite is true. In 10 years, you'll double your investment at 7.2%. So if you, can, if you divide the, the rate of return that you're looking at by 72, it should give you the time. It's not an exact equation. It's not meant to be, it's not an IRR, right? It's not meant to be that. It's meant to be quick and easy. There's a rule of 69.3 or 69.6 .6 and a rule of 69, and you get a little closer to being, to being accurate. But one of the key things here is, is, you know, that I see a lot of people get attracted to the non-performing loan space, which is a lot of the same reason that people get attracted to the fix and flip space for real property is, well, I want to make the big profits immediately. And that that's blinded by the risk that comes with that. <laughs> I mean, non-performing loans, fix and flip real property, you're, you're stepping into an asset that is greatly distressed, that requires capital injection, that is illiquid until the point of sale, right? Um, it's not where you wanna start. I, it, most newbies, it's never, you know, and most of the people that I talk to, I'm like, this is not, you're not ready for that. This is, you don't, you don't have the capital capacity and you don't want to expose all the capital that you have. So what you should do is get familiar with the asset class. You know, when it comes to loans, I'm a big advocate of go buy something that's got some cash flow to it. You know, get your first loan and get paid. Don't go get your first loan and have it be something that you got to dump money into. You know, again, back to the second lien kind of invest in genre where people are buying second liens that are, you know, 40, 50, $100,000 balances for a couple thousand dollars. The guy who sold that to you realizes the collectability of that is no. You just didn't. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the same thing comes with N NPLs. You know, N NPLs, there's a lot of risk. It's, it's, and it's not cut out for everybody. There's a lot of things that come with NPLs. You get no interior inspections. And a lot of people kind of talk, a lot of people play with this space and talk themselves out of it, but don't realize they talk, talk themselves out of it. You don't know, like you, Steve, you and I in, in the MAM portfolio, you know, we had the, the one asset. Remember, look, it was modern home USA, you know, Main Street USA, beautiful on the outside. Mm -hmm. The borrower finally got foreclosed. We got interior pictures and it was it's trashed, right? Mm -hmm. Holes in the wall, you know, things are broken. And you would have never known that from the idea of pride of ownership, which is one of the things that everybody talks about. You know, there's, you can get this pride <laughs> of ownership from exterior. Yeah. Um, but, the place looked great on the outside, nice little house in a good neighborhood. 
and he and his rage flooded the basement and created a mold problem just to just to get the last word in on the way out the door. Yeah. So I have had one, one foreclosure where the inside was rent ready. Yeah. Right. The the property always looks that you want to see what the property looks like. It always looks like the mortgage payments. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. That's true. So, so and so, so that, but if that's your game, and I like I like rehabs, I think they're great fun. Um, but I can't do them in I can't do them all over the country. If I'm going to play the NPN game, that if I play non-performing game, why don't I just go buy Arios? Um, unless I'm going to go play the seconds uh, game that you know that you that you of course you know don't care for, but the, because that's gambling, um, and know that I'm going to be a rehab. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be living the HGTV life, which is not fun. I've been there. <laughs> yeah, and you know, and that's that's obviously one of the other situations that an investor has to realize that you know you get into that NPL game and you really need you know your your boots on the ground. You got to have reliable contractors and agents. Which you know, I'll plug myself again. We're you know we're a licensed brokerage. I'm a licensed broker. We do have a nationwide network that that we do help investors you know identify and assign assets into qualified REO brokers that you know that that we help them establish. But you know, coming with that, you know, one two three Main Street, you still need a contractor, and that contractor still needs to be established and you know, these guys don't care. No, nobody's ever going to care about your money more than you. It's That's your right. money. That's you right. know, That's right. And, and being one little investor in a town, you know, by, you know in Cleveland um, with just one asset, you're not, nobody's going to give you any attention and nor should they, they should be taking care of real customers, which is, you know, which is where we continue to work on ideas for Gary where, you know, if, if I, if, if I owned 40 assets there, well now, you know, now, now I've, now somebody's going to pay attention to me. Right. Right. And so I think that's, that's more that that's more the play. You should identify, you identify what you're trying to accomplish. You make sure that all those reality checks line up and then you find something you can execute again and again and again. Right. And, and, you know, and one, one of the mistakes that I made is I bought, I bought notes in 12 states. I did not need to do that. I did not need to do that. I could have easily bought in, bought them in two, right? And simplified. You know, I've made, I've had to make friends with uh, attorneys and bankruptcy trustees and all these people along the way that, I, you know, that I didn't need to. Right. So. It's, it's it's certainly you. Cer so uh, you know, I want to touch on the, the 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 return expectations. Oh yeah, yeah. Do that because we're coming up. We're past time. So yeah. So you know, look when when we bid <laughs> we bid non-performing loans, we bid them to a twenty percent IRR, true discounted value of money, twenty percent IRR based on time and capital input for servicing. Uh, you calculate your servicing. If you if you can't afford servicing, you don't have the right bid. Um, and legal fees, and you know it's you're throwing a dart at a board when it comes to repair value, right? Um, but you do your best, error on the side of you know heavy, and you know see if you win the bid. When it comes to cash flow, you know I I what I see, you know, the, the, the reasonable cash flow expectation out there seems to be around 10%, whether it's eight to 12, you know, I call it 10, but call it eight to 12, 8%, you know, we see as relatively mitigated risk because there's some owner's equity, your, your, your loan to value, your investment loan to value is, is, is less than the value of the property. Um, so, you know, you might take a little bit of discount because that's going to be a little bit safer, 10% reasonable risk, um, 12%, you know, there, there's some, maybe it's an, a newly modified loan or something of that nature. When you start expecting 20% cash flow returns, you are into an asset that is well above your understanding of the risk, period. It's just, you're, you're in the wrong neighborhood, you got the wrong borrower, you got the wrong asset. Um, and, and so if, if that's the return that you need, you're, you're looking at the asset wrong. 
And with that, it's, it's okay to create a portfolio dynamic to your, your available capital saying, you know, I got $100,000 that I want to put out and you can go earn 10%, you know, over the course of two or three years and then bifurcate your investments a little bit uh, or diversify is really probably the better word to diversify your investments a little bit and start to take a little bit more risk after you have exposure to the asset class and you start to understand a little bit. But as you mentioned, you know, create some geographic concentration so that you, you, you build your team um, in, in a unified place and you, you, and you don't have to continually learn to, to be able to disposition your asset. So, so again, I want to suggest to everybody, if they need to reach, if they, they've got questions, they want to know more about this space, they want to look at a portfolio that they're working on, thinking about buying, or look at the assets they own now, potentially looking at selling some of them. Um, that's why Dion got on this call. Um, I've uh, been working with him for, well, now I said three and a half years, coming up on four, and, uh, and well, well, we're... We're still friends. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you challenge that every once in a while. I do, I do. <laughs> I do, no, I do. We, we have, you know, look, it's, it's one, of the, one of the nice things I, I, I like about this business is a lot of my counterparties and a lot of my investors have become, have become good friends. And, and I, I appreciate that. And I, I think there's a lot of good people out there. I take a lot of pride in helping people out um, we're, we're not just a, a loan brokerage, you know, but gone, gone are the days where we're just loan brokering. We're into, you know, full scale of, of real estate services. We, you know, I'm, I'm located in Northwest Indiana. We're a sub market of Chicago. We've got some really cool things going on the development and rental side. Uh, you know, we mentioned Gary a couple of times. Um, so, and, and we're always, you know, we're always looking for investors. Um, I have experience with portfolio management. I have experience with, with, with mitigation in, in that sense. And I, I enjoy helping people, um, you know, self-design their, their investment and their strategy. So, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, I'm a phone call away. I'm happy to talk about it. And, you know, based on that phone call, if we can, if we can do work, then we'll do it. If not, well, we, we had a nice phone call for sure. I talk on the phone a lot. Yes, you do. So I'm um, going to open it up real quick. If uh, anybody's got a burning desire or a question that they want to uh, raise, you can either quick chat um, and or throw shout, it out there. Like I said, shout, out, shout out to Jim Myers, right? Hey, Jim. Yeah, hey, Jim. <laughs> no. um, does everybody know that there's, a, there's like a chat button somewhere? Yeah, everybody does, I think. But if they don't, um, the best email address is dion.revest at, uh, at gmail. Oh, and it's John. Um, how did I, uh, John wants to know, why did I figure out I could trust Dion when I first started out, started with him? Um, well, John, it was clearly my good books. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was 2000 bigger pocket posts crying bullshit on other people. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Um, he's he's uh, too young to be a curmudgeon, but he is. Um, and we spent a fair amount of time talking. We looked at a lot of assets. Um, went back and forth on this for months before I uh, before I uh, pulled the trigger. Um, it was uh, um, uh, some background research I did, uh, proof of experience. Um, I've been buying and selling credit cards and payday loans and all that sort of stuff for a long time. And uh, I can't always, can't always smell a scam because I've been caught a couple of times, but uh, um, I, you know, he, he, he showed me he knows more than me. And that's, I, I never want to be the smartest guy in the room. You know, one, one thing I'll just add to that for my own accord um, is my approach, and again, back to my, my, my relationship with you. You and I are friends, right? You know, you know three and a half years, four years. Uh, you know, we've met each other in person. I've been to California. We've done some meetups. Um, 
this isn't, I, I'm not, I didn't broker you alone and, and never pick up the phone. Okay. Um, and, and this is often the case with a lot of the clients that come through. You're, you're going to have questions and I expect to field those questions for you. Um, you know, oftentimes I probably sell myself short. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not your capital manager. I'm not an investment fund. I never, you know, I never went back out and raised a fund, uh, but we're here. We, if we did your transaction and oftentimes that included a package of due diligence and, you know, and, and product sales, um, I, I have a very good understanding of your asset and I understand the work that we put into it. And so I expect me to be one of the phone calls that you would make if something comes up and I still continually help all of our clients from assets, you know, it doesn't matter how soon or how recent or, or how vintage the, the investment was made. If, if something pops up, I'm, I'm a email or phone call away mm -hmm. and I'm happy to step back in. Right. We're, we're, we're going through that now, right. You know, we're, we're going through a couple of, couple assets that we're working through some issues in, in your portfolio and certainly not sitting around as your capital manager. Um, Evan's got a question, uh, um, about seconds, uh, loan amount, um, and are you all about performing seconds? Are you all about performing seconds? What about seconds in California? Um, I'll take a little nibble at this. I think the, as a small investor, um, if you're looking to uh, play in California, you probably have to probably have to play in seconds, um, and which puts you which puts you part investor and part gambler. Um, the one of the adages that I've been trying to pay attention to is. When I think I'm investing, I'm probably speculating. And when I think I'm speculating, I'm probably gambling. Uh, and I think seconds are, are uh, uh, speculating, simple as that. Um, and if then there's nothing wrong with, spe with speculating, but you have, to, you have to know that there's a lot you don't know when you go do, when you go do it. Um, I like California because it's fast. Foreclosure here is uh, remarkably quick compared to, compared to other places, um, and you've also got a borrower who is more able to rescue himself with a new deal than uh, than in other parts of the country that don't earn the kind of money that they earn here. Um, but we we are also in a very uh, frothy uh, uh, marketplace right now where um, affordability here in California is just well it's just non-existent. Um, and there's people that are well they're living they're not they're not paying their rent because they can't which means they aren't going to be able to reperform uh, but uh but i you know i'm i'm more a fan of i'm more a fan of the collection side of the world um because that's where i come from so um like i said if i had started over again i probably would have diversified and bought some uh low, close to home seconds too let, let me take a swing at the seconds. Uh, you know, to, to those that know me know that I really don't like seconds. Uh, you're, you're automatically in an inferior position. Um, you, you, and there's a low, there's a low entry, there's a low barrier of entry because of the capital in. They trade at that low barrier of entry because the collectability is limited. Um, and the, 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 the street level marketplace advertises them differently. The street level of advertisers saying, look, you, you can get in for low barrier of entry and you can foreclose, potentially start servicing the first lien. Um, the thing that I, I just find that all, all wrong, you know, you're, you're, you're into a second, you got into a second, let's just say you got in for five grand, you got a first lien at $100,000 because you bought a $50,000 second and you're going to start servicing. But if, if, that, if, if that first lien if I'm a first lien owner, which I primarily play with, um, and I have the opportunity to trigger do on sale and get paid or, or take you out, don't, don't kid yourself. I know the rules. I'm triggering it and you're toast. So the second lien investor, the, the, that barrier of entry with limited capital really is a barrier because you don't have enough money to deal with the ramifications that can potentially come your way. Yeah. And that's why I don't like seconds for newbies. It's just, it's, da I, it's dangerous. I, I'll just share this with you too. I love this story. The, the, one of my good friends, 
uh, Sonny, shout out to Sonny in California, that I traded with 10, 10 12 years ago. I traded 60 loans. <laughs> he hates this story. I traded 60 loans that our investment fund purchased for $10 a piece, literally $600. We bought them in a series of first and second liens. The balance was 3.5 million. He bought them for one point, 35,000. I bought them for $600. His fund at the time that he was managing that fund was a second lien fund. They eventually went out of business. And that is the story of second liens. Uh, Jim, I just foreclosed on the first and the second got wiped out. Second, yeah, see, there you go, Jim. Jim's right. Second, second liens, you're, you know, second, you can say the second lien's the first loser. <laughs> you know, you, you're the first in line to lose. Uh, I just, you know, I, I wouldn't want to be there. No. So no. It's, back, it's back to speculating. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's nothing wrong with that, but that's a different conversation than building an investment quality cash flow stream. Yeah, that you know, that's a that's a good way to articulate it, right? You know, it's if that's if that's what you're doing, you're just out kind of gambling with some money and great, go gamble. You know, go do it. You know, maybe maybe you win, maybe you don't. But you're not you're not building a portfolio, you're not you're not building wealth, you're you're not really uh putting a real plan in <laughs> that you're you're gonna be able to manage. Yeah. So so uh, Matt just asked the question, if I could get eight percent in a fund. Why would I do that rather than buy an eight or ten percent uh, first performing uh, note? And I have some investments that pay. I've got some some money in some some publicly traded REITs. I've got a couple. Of, I got some money in a couple of um, larger private REITs that are paying a decent yield. Um, but the it's you know I. I've always been wrong about the stock market, so I, you know, so I've stopped doing, I stopped doing that. But when I put my money in a fund, I'm trusting a fund manager, and I'm trusting them to be solvent. Um, you can't once you put the money in the fund. If you came back tomorrow and said I changed my mind, can I have my money back? They're going to say no. Um, it's it's gone. It's gone. It's completely illiquid. I own I own the first. I can sell it. You know, I can control it. They don't pay. I can decide whether I want to give them a modification or whether I want to uh, whether I want to foreclose. I have I've got complete control. My name is on title, right? and you know my name's my name's my name is recorded against that property. There is a lien. Um, in a fund, I'm well. Uh, like I said the November issue of the uh, paper source: two point three billion dollars. Stolen from note investors in 2019, and uh, but Bill Moncaro just names you know company after company: uh, McKinley Mortgage, uh, Fiscal Concierge, Global Credit Recovery, uh, Madison Timber, Vision Quest, Wealth Manager, on and on. Um, so, and I I know people that are running funds that are doing their darndest, and you know are as honest as can be, and things change. Things change. Yeah. I think, Steve. I think too. You know, look. I think it's a it's a matter of investor preference. You know, re return is return. I always like to say, get married to return, not the asset, right? So, investor preference. You know, some investors want to have some <laughs> notation of of hands on capability. You, you know, when when we talk about returns, when I talk about returns, I talk about it in a, in a little bit of a static sense in ten and twenty percent there's a bell curve to returns. It doesn't mean that you can't outmanage that, you know, that standard return. And certainly you can, you know, but you know, number, number one, you've got to get be able to get into the trade to make it work. And then number two, you've got to be able to manage your way to a successful return. And, you know, to do that, you've got to have some, some decent understanding of, of the asset class, whether you're investing in timber, gold, or, or whole loans or, you know, or, or real property. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, a lot of people, especially in today's day and age, they want to control their investments. They want to have some feeling of that control. And I think it's a matter of, of preference, but it doesn't matter where you get eight or 10% from you got eight or 10%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And if, uh, and I'm just, I, I guess I'm, I still can't retire. <laughs> so. I can, if I work, I can make it better. You wouldn't, you wouldn't if you could, 
yeah. because I remember this conversation three years ago when Steve was like, yeah, I'm not doing anything. And now he's back to a full debt collection business yeah. and all kinds of stuff. So yeah. I've only, I've only written 2000 loans since you and I met. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, let's wrap up this call. Um, I want to thank everybody for the time. I want to encourage you to, uh, let your friends, uh, in the, in, in the space know that Dion's available and encourage you to reach out to him directly. Um, he's been, you know, he's, he's going to tell you his truth. And, uh, and, and for that, I, for that, I'm grateful. So, so anyway, so thanks for the hour, Dion. And thanks, thanks to all of you for uh, hanging in with us. And uh, we do this once a month. I uh, don't know what I'm going to talk about next month. So if anybody's got an idea, we'll do that. So, all right. So you all take care and we'll, uh, we'll see you next time. All right. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thanks, Dion. Bye. Bye, guys.